And then I remember bringing the, the shoot back in the CEO seat and going like, are you on drugs? We can't run this. And the whole thing, that's a million dollars spent, never used. And we didn't get fired. You're listening to Philly Who, the podcast that tells the stories of the doers, thinkers, and performers of Philadelphia. My name is Kevin Schmidlin, and today I'm talking with Steve Grass. Steve is the founder of Quaker City Mercantile, a Philly branding agency that focuses on spirits. Steve and his company have invented tons of products and brands, including Hendrix Gin, Sailor Jerry Rum, and countless more at Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. In this episode, you'll hear how, before settling down in Philadelphia, Steve started out in the advertisement industry by creating ad campaigns while living all over the globe. I had secretly written a letter to Charles and Morris Saatchi in London, and I said, I want to work for you in New Zealand. And they wrote back and said, you're very strange, go ahead. He'll share the story of how not long after that, he would create Gyro Worldwide, an ad agency that would quickly establish itself with in-your-face, controversial campaigns that garnered national attention. Every, like HBO, every news source around the world was calling us. We had protesters in front of that office. And we'll talk about how some of Quaker City's biggest spirits brands came to be and how they made their way into pretty much every bar in the Western world. We started noticing our royalty checks were exceeding that. And that's when um, Grants came and said, you can't own one of our biggest brands. I'm like, oh. All this and more about Steve Grass and his reputation as Philly's own Don Draper, now on Philly Who. Stay tuned. Just a heads up, there is some cursing in this episode. So Steve Grass has made a successful career out of advertising, branding, and telling stories. As you'll hear, he'll be the first to admit that a decent amount of his work did not agree with everyone. And while he's now moved on from the life of million-dollar tobacco commercial shoots and Michael Bay-esque Hollywood bikini action movies, Gyro Worldwide and later Quaker City Mercantile has pushed the envelope for multinational brands, including MTV and Puma, for decades. Today, Stephen focuses on creating spirits and does so via the distillery he owns in Tamworth, New Hampshire. And you can taste those spirits at their shop in Old City called Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. And you can even make their cocktails at home via the colonial recipe book that Steve authored. Before building his branding empire, Steve grew up in nearby Souderton, where in high school, he played in a band. The band itself wasn't that great, but, One of Steve's teachers noticed how amazing their level of promotion was, and he approached Steve with some advice. He said, you know, your band sucks, but the promotion was really good, and maybe you should consider going into marketing. Wow. And a light bulb literally went off, because we had really good posters and promotion, and we would always have tons of people coming to our shows, and the music wasn't bad, it just wasn't you know, it wasn't great. So that's how you got into, into advertising into and marketing. marketing. Well, and also my father owned a uh, printing company and I worked in the art department every day after school. So this is where I made all the posters and things for my band. Cause I, uh, I had to work after school every day and I was in paste up. So back then before computers, you literally uh, set the type and then took a photo of it in the photo dark room and then you put wax on the back of the paper and then you'd glue it down on that and then you would take another photo. It was it was very complex, but I, I worked in the printing business. So if you would have told that kid that was working for your dad's shop that he would go build a whole life and career out of marketing, would he have believed you? Uh, yeah, I knew I was going to take over the world because I knew um, I had this theory After high school, everyone else went off to college, but I was an exchange student in um, Thailand. I was right along the Cambodian border. I used to hear thunder on a bright sunny day. I'm like, what's that? And they said, that's the Khmer Rouge fighting. It was literally 10 miles away. I was told not to uh, ride my bike too close to the border because they were, the Khmer Rouge were kidnapping people to drain them of their blood for the, you know, for the soldiers. But anyway, I noticed when every time I went to Bangkok, which was four hours away by car that people somehow seem to think that if you're a Westerner, you knew what you were doing. Okay. So I hatched this crazy plan that I was going to go get internships all over the world and then use that experience to 
get a job on Madison Avenue at you know a big ad, ad, ad agency. So I, I went to Thailand for a year, came back, went to Syracuse my freshman year, and then I went to Kathmandu for a year. Um, and then I worked in Hong Kong. I worked in Bangkok again, and then I worked in London. Came back to Syracuse senior year. I talked Syracuse into let, letting me grade myself for two years. So I- You graded yourself? Yeah, it now, was how awesome. Did that, wait, how did that work? <laughs> I had a plan. I think if you went to a school and you said, I have a plan, here's what right, I'm going to do. Right. I came back senior year, graduated, and I got a uh, job at Young and Rubicon. And they said, we've never hired somebody in the creative position right out of school before, but we're offering you a job. And I turned it down. Why? I had secretly written a letter to Charles and Morris Saatchi in London. And I said, I want to work for you in New Zealand. And they wrote back and said, you're very strange. Go ahead. Why New Zealand? Because uh, it was as far away as you could get. Literally, it was on the other side of the planet. And I just thought it'd be kind of cool. I also thought if I went to New Zealand as an American, the Kiwis would think that somehow I knew what I was doing. And I would come back with an, an amazing TV reel and print portfolio, right. which I did. So I went down to New Zealand and the, um, the head of the New Zealand, of Saatchi's New Zealand said, I don't know anything about you. I'm, you don't have a job here. And I was like, I just spent all my money to fly here. Wait, so they said that after you had already after arrived. I arrived. But then they, I gave him my letter that I got from the Saatchi's and they called, uh, he called London and he goes, you got a job. Wow. So I was there for two years. I, I was interesting too, because in, in New Zealand, I was offered... Um, at the age of 21 to be the creative director of uh, McCann Eric's in Singapore. And I would have been the youngest creative director in their whole network. But again, I turned it down because what I saw was a bunch, every expat that I saw working internationally was sad, lonely, alcoholic, didn't have a family. And I'm like, I, I don't want that to be me. So I flew home and I worked in an agency in Miami, knowing that I was going to start my own agency which I did. I started Gyro when I was 23. So did you, when you were down in Miami, did you know that you would come back to Philly to start the agency? Yes. Because again, my dad had a printing company. Right. And I thought that I could start this thing um, in, in the attic of his printing company and I could make it seem like I had a receptionist. Right. <laughs> and uh, and I he wasn't going to charge me rent for the first couple of years. So that's what I did. And then the first thing I did was I wrote, audaciously wrote letters to everyone. I wrote a letter to um, Abby Turkuli, who was the uh, creative director of MTV. And I said, I've just come back from New Zealand. Here's some color photocopies from my portfolio. And he said, come up here. Wow. So first client I had was MTV. That's a heck of a first client. Yeah. We got a bunch of local clients. Blue Cross hired us. Comcast hired when they were Metrophone. And then we were chugging along for a while. We had a mixture of like some big national stuff with MTV. And then we had some good local business. And for an upstart agency, we were, we made, I think we made pretty big splash when we first came in town, but then we did the uh, Zipperhead campaign. Yeah. So, so Zipperhead was a, I don't even know if it still is a t-shirt shop on South street. It was for years during the whole punk thing. And now it's called crash bang boom. Same people. Yeah. You now at this point you have these, these traditional corporate clients in Philly. I had, I, we got some nice project work from MTV, but we, most of our business was corporate work in Philly. And you get approached by Zipperhead. And now this, this was, this is a famous thing that happened in that you made posters with Charles Manson and Jeffrey Dahmer. And they said things like, go a little insane now, not a lot of insane later. Okay, so was that your idea? Was that- That was all right, that was my idea. We sent them out to the press and instantly caused a worldwide like chaos. Now before that went anywhere, what did you think would happen? Did you think a lot of people would see it or did you think that it would become as- I didn't know, I mean, again, this is before the internet. So it's like, you know, well, how bad could it be? But suddenly we were like, Every, like HBO, every news source in America, around the world was calling us. We had protesters in front of the office and I was like, ah, oh, shit. So, so um, were you worried when this was going down? Hell yeah. We lost Comcast. We lost Metrophone because we double, it was a double whammy because the Zipperhead thing came out and then we also did a TV spot for them where we had a bloody lifelike brain sitting on a stool with a microphone in front of the brain and, and the brain was saying, hello, I'm a brain. And it's a really intelligent time to order cable. And that's when we got the call from Brian Roberts, 
saying, no, yeah. you, you need to go away. Yeah. <laughs> but what's interesting is after that, we got calls from uh, Budweiser um, National. We got a call from Coca-Cola. You know, CAA in, in Hollywood was handling the Coke business at the time. And for shits and giggles, we sent, I sent a letter to the CEO of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco and it just said, Joe Camel is the best anti-smoking campaign of all time. And that, what was the response? CEO wants to talk to you. Wow. Get your ass down here. Yeah. So I flew down to Winston-Salem and started a 20-year relationship with R.J. Reynolds Tobacco. I mean, it's funny because you talk about like, uh, you know, Mad Men and all that. Having a tobacco client was like the last days of Rome burning and Mad Men all combined. Because we would get like, you know, a million bucks to go do a photo shoot. We'd hire, like, I remember our photo shoots, we would have stuntmen, helicopters. And then I remember bringing the, the shoot back and the CEO scene and going like, are you on drugs? You can't run this. <laughs> and the whole thing, that's a million dollars spent, never, never used. And we didn't get fired. Because they were just down with the whole alternative style that you guys had? Yeah, I mean, we created a brand called Red Camel, Camel the K. Yeah. And for a while, it was really cool. I mean, again, I always say working with tobacco before the FDA got involved was like being a pirate. I mean, it was evil, but it was fun. I mean, we had private planes. We were flying all over saying five-star hotel. It was fun. I'm glad that era passed, but I'm glad I also experienced it. It was, it was crazy. We handled Camel, Winston, Salem, Cool, American Spirit. What happened during that time, no one else would hire us. No one else wanted to know us. Why not? Because we were pariahs. We were the... We were the people you saw on TV. The movie, Thank You for Smoking, that was me, man. It was this crazy, crazy time. The only other company that hired us at the time was Puma, which we handled globally, right up to the point where they sold the brand to Kering, which is Gucci. And famously, they wanted to pay me in shares. And I said, no, I need cash. And they ended up selling it for $7.8 billion. I imagine you wish you took the shares. That's funny, but you know what, whatever. <laughs> but what happened was, this is what's crazy. So, you know... We were getting paid monopoly money by tobacco. So we started experimenting with, we did Bikini Bandits, started Gmart, which was a pop-up fake convenience store. Now, where are all these ideas coming from? From my brain. Yeah. One of the other things we started was Sailor Jerry. Yes. So you acquired the IP rights to Norman K. Collins. Yes. Why? Um, there was somebody who worked for me at the time who was into tattoos and he said, I think we should start our own clothing company. And I said, I don't know anything about clothing. He said, trust me, just do this. So we started a shitty little t-shirt shop, but acquired the rights to uh, Norman Collins' art estate. We acquired his estate. For right. Our so, but what's the thought process behind that, right? I mean, it's one thing to say, I'm going to make clothes. But then well, you think, well, we need something to put on the clothes. So let's... We thought tattoo, old school tattoo culture was a really interesting brandscape. I don't know what the word is for. Sure. But we thought it was it was imbued with a lot of authenticity and and rich storytelling. At the time we weren't thinking about it like brand world. But anyway, we started it as a clothing store in Old City. It did okay, but at the time we also had William Grandsons as a client. They were one of the other few people that would hire us when we had tobacco. Okay. <laughs> and um they said we need a uh, gin and a rum in our portfolio. And I said all right, so I went to Scotland and saw Sir Charles Gordon Grant. I went to see his gin palace in Scotland, and I went in, and it was basically a garage that had two ancient stills in it, and they were uh, from the 1830s. Really cool. But it instantly made me be like, oh, wow, Victorian apothecary, Jules Verne. I had the whole idea for Hendrix when I walked out the door. And then for the rum, I was like, I have this shitty clothing company that's going nowhere. What if I license grants the name for Sailor Jerry and the artwork and I call it Sailor Jerry Rum. That way at least it can help me promote my shitty t-shirt company. It took off. It right took, away? It, no. It took off. Like They were actually going to discontinue it several times because it wasn't moving. And then it's always like that story uh, you always hear like, how did a band make it? Well, some Midwestern DJ had a stack of records and accidentally put it on. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what happened to Sailor Jerry in Madison, Wisconsin. It just, for some reason, it took off. And then it spread to other Rust Belt 
cities. It spread to, to the Dakotas. It spread to Minneapolis. Royalty checks got bigger and bigger. And soon they, because also the clothing company started taking off. So, you know, at one point we were doing over a hundred grand a month on clothing sales online, early days of the internet too. So we started noticing our royalty checks were getting, were exceeding that. And that's when um, Grants came and said, you can't own one of our biggest brands. I'm like, oh. And then they, it was like this funny uh, Austin Powers, Dr. Evil moment where they said, we're willing to pay you $1 million. I'm like, it doesn't seem right to Yeah, me. a pinky to the mouth. And you're just like, it um, that's seems, not a lot. <laughs> yeah. So we did some smart stuff and researched lawyers who do liquor deals. Yeah. And we found uh, the guy who did this Vega deal. And we're like, let's get him. So it was this Texan with a cowboy hat. Flew up here, literally with a cowboy hat and cowboy boots on. <laughs> the moment we hired him, the deal changed. Yeah. You know, in an instant, we made more money doing that than we ever did anything else. How did that change things for you? Well, we finally were in a place where tobacco was no fun anymore. Once it went under the FDA, which it should be, it was no longer... Uh, it wasn't the Wild West It wasn't anymore. the Wild West. And Reynolds got bought by British Tobacco, which had a very different view of of they they weren't good old boys anymore. They weren't going to be doing million dollar throwaway no, photo, no. photo so shoots. So suddenly we were like, <laughs> all right, this really, it's like working on pharma. And it was like, I don't want to do that. So when we sold Sailor Jerry, I was just like, guys, you've been great clients, great people, but I think, you time know, to time to end this. Yeah. Um, also I had kids and I was like, I don't really want my kids to, I mean, don't, they know that I worked on it, but I don't want to have this be my legacy. That's why we stopped making bikini films. Too. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> Just in time. Yeah, grew um, up, grew up a little bit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so but then we uh, started Art in the Age. Yeah, so Art in the Age of Mechanical yeah, reproduction. reproduction. Where did that come from? Again, there was somebody who worked here, who wanted to start a T-shirt line. And he said, "Would you fund it?" I said, "Yeah, okay." So we did T-shirts for a while, and it it didn't sell. And he he quit and moved to New York. So I was like, "All right, I'm just gonna." I think it'd actually be a cool name for a brand of spirits. So we started. Um, we opened the shop. We basically said, well, let's do what we did with Sailor Jerry. Let's open a shop and have that be the brand home. And so we started Art in the Age. I love where it's going now because it's really about um, very esoteric flavors. So you, you mentioned uh, the distillery in New Hampshire. Now that's on a, what, 72 acre estate in Tamsworth, New Hampshire. The distillery isn't on the farm. The distillery is in the village. And in the village, I think there's at the most 500 people in the village. Um, we bought the, uh, the old general store and that's a cafe coffee shop called the Tamworth Lyceum. And then we bought the old inn. So how did the town react when you um, started doing initially, this? Initially, we got a very cold shoulder. It's interesting. Two things broke that. One, my uncle Buck, uh, funny story. He was, um from Meredith, New Hampshire. He was the fire chief, six foot five, all muscle. He grew up next to Bob Montana that created the Archie cartoons. Oh, yeah. And my uncle Buck was in the original Archie cartoons called Big Buck Buckland. <laughs> and he became Moose. I know. <laughs> and everybody in that part of New Hampshire still knows who Buck Buckland was. He died years ago. But so people are like, you're related to Buck? I'm like, yeah. Oh, so you're not so bad. Um, and I think the other thing that changed things was uh, we literally did everything we said we would do. So we had several town meetings where we showed the design of the distillery. Um, and when we built it, I think people were really like, wow, it yeah. turned out really well. And we've stayed very, um, we've hired all local, everyone who works there is from there with the exception of my older brother who runs it. Um, but the rest of our, we have, we have 20 employees up there and they're all uh, young local people that would have moved away otherwise. And uh, we work exclusively with all the local farms. So it's brought back agriculture. It's kept young people staying in town. Um, 20 jobs in a place that, that was- Didn't have that, any. Didn't have anything. All this time, You've remained based in Philadelphia. Yes. I can, I can only imagine that that was very intentional. So, I mean, I, I've always had a sense of place. I think it's important. I think, I think young people think if I move somewhere else, it'll be better. Yeah. Oh, everyone does. But 
the whole world's shit. <laughs> it's not going to be better anywhere. And I think what I think was interesting too is I think it's interesting to try to make it in a place that hasn't already happened yet. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I, Philly's changed dramatically in the 30 years we've been in business. Most of it's good. I mean, we worked with Steve Starr when he first opened. He would hire us too. He wasn't afraid of the tobacco. Yeah, yeah. But I was with him when he had, you know, before he had a restaurant with the bank. And then we worked with him on the Continental and Budokan and all of them. Yeah. So, I mean, the Philly that I know yeah. today w is generally down with the more edgy yeah. style of things. But when you were starting out, it was very conservative. So well, what, what kept you here? Uh, well, history, family, cheap rent, major airport. Yeah. New York's an hour away. It had everything you needed. I find the creative process works best in isolation. Okay. So if I was in New York, every time I go to, when I was, when we were in the height of doing all the Puma and all the big shoots, I would go to LA and have a ball. And I would just be like, how, I wouldn't get anything done if I was here. Yeah. Cause you're so, and you're also influenced by what other people are doing. So in Philly, we would be in total, totally in an isolated, like we never interacted with the other ad agencies. Because I, I don't, I'm sure they're nice people, but I've never been a fan of the local work. I don't care. I don't, I don't want to get pharma or, I mean, we just happen to be here. Right, yeah. Right? I also think what I always loved about Philly was the um, scuzz, you know? It's like the skanky scuzz <laughs> that you see came to life in Sailor Jerry. Yeah, I just think Philly's got, I mean, it was cool to be in a place where it hadn't been done. Yeah. So you, so you mentioned, though, on the, on the flip side, so Philly has benefited very much from the, the brain drain that you alluded to that's happening to many towns in the country, right? So people in these sort of more remote places, yeah. the smart people leave and go to big cities nowadays. Yeah. And you're working to reverse that. Is that right? Okay. Well, first of all, it's different because in Philly we always had a policy where we wouldn't hire anyone from out of town. Okay. You had to be from Philly for us to hire you because what always happened, we experimented with it in the beginning. And when we brought people from out of town, they'd, they'd come down here and hate it because Philly had a special funk to it. That yeah. You, if you were born into it, you could tolerate it. If you weren't, you were running for the door. <laughs> <Right>. Okay. <laughs> we also never hired people with a lot of experience Nearly everyone who works here uh, started here right out of college, yeah. and I've trained them myself. We've had an incredible rate of um, retention with our senior people. Like my senior designer has been here for 28 years. Wow. And he did Sailor Jerry, Hendrix, Narragansett. He's done all the new Guinness work. We keep hiring a lot of young people out of school, and then we train them. and. They either stay, they'll, if they stay, they'll stay for 10, 15 years or else it's not for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you don't need to have, like, I don't want you to have a lot of experience. Now, you've said that, you've been quoted as saying that booze will save the world. Yes. How? Why? Okay. So <laughs> what does that mean? What we've done in Tamworth, I think, could be replicated in small rural towns all over, all over the planet, not just in the States. Tamworth... I will venture to say it was down on its luck. It hadn't had a, any sort of manufacturing for forever. Um, the general store that we bought was about to be turned into Section 8 housing. Wow. And when we built the distillery, what it does is it gives young people a job they want to work on and they want to learn. So it's something they want to be an apprentice at. Unlike, again, working in pharma or something that's not interesting. This is like rich storytelling. So it, it, it does that. It, it creates tourism in a good way, agricultural tourism. It revitalizes farming. Uh, historically, farmers would turn their crops into spirits because they got a higher margin for them, and it would preserve them. So what's interesting, New Hampshire, especially Tamworth, lost its farming in 1817, the year without a summer famous around the world. It's when Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, big volcano in Indonesia, J.W. Turner painted all the sunset scent and it snowed in New Hampshire 12 months of the year. Wow. They got two feet of snow in August. All the farmers left. Anyway, there's been no farming there for a long time. 
Um, what we can do is go in and say, we not only will we buy your crops, we guarantee you a certain price because we know exactly what we're going to need. So I have a couple questions that I ask every guest just to get different perspectives. What's a common misconception about you? Oh, I guess a common misconception about me is that I'm still the crazy ad guy from the 90s. Okay. I mean, there's probably quite a few stories out there of me terrorizing employees, making them cry. Sorry. Sorry if, sorry if I made you cry. But um, since I've become a family man, and since I'm in the world of spirits, I'm a sweet person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, if you could send a message, butterfly effect aside, if you could send a message to yourself in the past at any point, would you? And, and if so, what would you say? Maybe like get out of the ad game sooner. Okay. Why? Build equity in things that you own, not... Don't spend your time coming up with ideas for other people's things. Spreading stuff. the word on other people's things. Yeah. Although I think it's really interesting. I still have a lot of friends in the ad business and the film business. And you just see their businesses slipping away or changing so dramatically that they don't really have the same grasp on it. And I'm, I think we, it's like a, the disaster film. Like we got out of the building before it collapsed. From your perspective, what's the biggest challenge facing Philadelphia today? We've noticed, you know, we only hire people from Philly, but more and more when we interview people, they've moved here from somewhere else. And it used to be, oh, does your spouse work at Urban or Comcast? And now it's like, no, we just picked up and moved here. And that's great. They're going to be a big problem with our schools. Ah. Because I think all these young people moving to the city, the moment they have kids, they still don't, it, it's going to be a real problem here. Um, I also feel like, you need to have two political parties or you're going to have this incredible corruption that's existed here for years. And it's why we don't spend money on infrastructure or, or, you know, it's why my, you know, right here on the corner here when the river of the pipe burst and uh, we were out of work for two days. That's because corrupt government's not spending money on infrastructure. On the flip side, what's the most encouraging thing you see in Philadelphia today? Optimism. Yeah. So it's Is that inter- new here? <laughs> Absolutely. It's interesting. I've never seen a bigger group of naysayers and people with uh, self-confidence issues than Philly. It's just like, oh, we'll never. I mean, I inferiority think. Inferiority complex. Inferiority complex is huge. But I, and I, I think it's part of the city's charm. So it's interesting that people now start believing, oh, we can win the Super Bowl. Yeah. We can have nice things. It's really awesome, but I hope it doesn't uh, ruin the distinct funk of Philly. I think Philly's a lot, I spend a lot of time in Boston. Philly's a lot cooler than Boston. Yeah, yeah. No, it is. And it's totally about, it goes back to the Puritans versus the Quakers, you know, and that whole thing. Oh, uh, one of the bad things about Philly becoming cool again you have to actually make a dinner reservation. Oh, yeah. You can't just stroll into the I best know. restaurant. <laughs> yeah. You can stroll in anywhere you want. Yeah, yeah. Now it's like, oh, right. okay. Chris Wink on, on Christopher Wink, the founder of Technically Media, uh, mentioned in his episode a couple weeks ago that if you change anything bad about something, it usually changes what's good about it, too. I think that's true. And it's interesting that the city is definitely changing. I mean... I, I don't think Amazon's coming here, but it would be wonderful and awful if they did. Yeah, it, yeah, it would. Yeah, exactly. It would change the bad, but it would also change the good. You see, like I find it funny. I was reading. Um, I was reading. I think there was a Philly Mag article about some hipster dude moved to Portland, Oregon, to be cool, only to find out that all the cool people in Portland, Oregon, were moving to West Philly. They're, yeah, they're coming. And I thought here. that was really funny. Yeah. That's why I, I think it's funny when people chase wherever yeah wherever. the coolness is i don't think philly will ever be like you know brooklyn right i hope it doesn't yeah for more on steve and quaker city mercantile you could head to podphillywho.com forward slash grass that's g-r-a-s-s-e if you like the show be sure to subscribe and give us a rating on apple podcasts and also tune in on Twitter and Instagram at Pod Philly Who. Philly Who is a Q9 production. Special thanks to Tim O. Weymouth and Jonathan Turner, and to everybody at Quaker City Mercantile and to Steve Grass for appearing on the show. 
Music by Lee Rosevere. Podcast art by Lauren Carhart. For Philly Who, my name is Kevin Schmidlin. See you next week. <laughs>